Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. A very warm welcome to this plenary session on climate justice and gender equality. My name is Shahira Amin. Uh, I think that there's a, the, an echo with the two mics, so I'll move away from the microphone. I'm Shahira Amin. I'm an independent journalist based in Cairo, Egypt. Delighted to be with you here in Kigali. So, as we're about to find out, climate change and gender justice are intertwined. We cannot achieve climate justice without empowering women. If women, who are at the heart of the climate crisis, indigenous communities and other vulnerable groups are empowered, to be leaders driving climate action, they're likely to come up with smart and innovative solutions to this crisis. So, let's start off by watching a short animated video. And allow me to introduce our first speaker, Ineza Umuhoza Grace. She's a Rwandan eco-feminist and a champion for climate justice. Please give her a big hand. Ineza. Welcome to Vanda again. And I'm standing here to add my voice in testifying and testifying that climate justice is gender justice. When local policies are having instruments that are inclusive for women and youth, you can see the impact. I mean, in my experience, it's not in every country that we find a young girl that has been a dream to create a non-governmental organization that is working closely with the government in advancing climate action. It's not a myth that climate change is affecting women and young girls. We are from the community living those examples. But guess what? Women and young girls of today are no longer wanting to be victims they are part of the solution makers within their community. But every time I step out of my country in the international process, I came to face every challenges that young girls are having. Women who are making change, changes are facing enormous challenge, especially being reminded that climate leaders does not look like us, does not dance like us, does not speak like us, and you cannot be an expert coming from a grassroots community. But to those voices, I like to tell them that I'm coming from my country, my continent. No one can speak better with the sake of my country like I do. <laughs> Having a team of young young people, women and girls who having ambition to create a better world today is what drives me. And with the policy of my country that are really um, inclusive, it gives me a hope to really be aspired to change even the international process. So as we stand here today, let us learn how to make active space for women and youth engagement in the climate action so that we can redefine solidarity, having the norms of mutual respect and the fact of leaving no one behind. That is the only way we are going to be able to create lasting solutions for today's crisis. Thank you so much. As I close, I would like you to invite you to watch a small video that would kinda try to uh, incorporate everything I was saying. Thank you so much. Age five years old, I woke up to find my bedroom was suddenly a lake. Furious wind and rain had torn the roof of our house in Kigali, Rwanda. 
It was a terrifying experience that would warn of things to come and shape my life. My name is Ineza Omohosa Grace, and today I describe myself as an ecofeminist, impact-driven actor. Ineza means kindness. It was chosen for me by my mom, who I saw as Wonder Woman growing up. She fought for her education in a culture where women were expected to marry, have children, and always defer to men. She inspires me to believe in myself as a woman, even when others don't. Well, actually, both my mom and Rihanna inspired me. <laughs> I remember loving Snow White because she was so kind to animals. Now I am producing my own animation with a grant from the National Geographic Society to educate young people on climate change issues in the style that they will love and connect with. After all, nobody can really hate a cartoon. <laughs> when I started my organization, my male colleagues encouraged me to hide the fact that I was the founder. I still receive constant criticism for being outspoken in a culture which stipulates that women should be quiet. It compares me to shout my message even louder to inspire other women and young people. I believe if organizations here work with rural Gwandan families, they can use their unique environmental knowledge to combat local climate change issues such as flooding. But remember, while extreme weather affects the most vulnerable community first, it will eventually touch all of our lives. I would therefore encourage everyone watching to become a voice for climate change in a way that works for your own community. Encourage your local leaders to prioritize sustainability and educate those around you to enact change while we still can. I am hopeful and confident that the world will soon come to understand we are all interconnected. Together, we can breathe a greener world. Wasn't that amazing? Ine, thank you. And yes, we need to work collectively for a greener world. And Ineza means kindness. We need kindness and empathy to be part of this fight. So before I introduce our esteemed panelists, let's bring you into the conversation. So we're going to ask you a few questions and we want you to select one of the answers from the list below the questions. All you have to do is go to your app and look for the plenary session, this plenary session, scroll down to the bottom of the session page, and you'll find the button to enter the polling. When you open the live polling, you'll find the three questions there that we want you to answer. So, the first question, have you found it? How many of you have found it? No Wi-Fi. No Wi-Fi. Ooh. We tested yesterday. Here it is. Okay. So I'll give you more time. The first question is, to what degree is your work currently at the nexus of gender and climate justice? So please choose just one answer that reflects your situation. Question two, what do you need to be uh, you need most to be prepared to tackle climate justice in your work? Do you need training? Do you need data and evidence? Do you need practical learning materials such as guides, case studies? Do you need a community of practice, funding? Nothing at all. Or, I don't know, you can answer any of those. And question three is the last question of of today's topics on the nexus of climate and gender justice, which is most relevant to your work? What are you most excited to learn about today?
Topic one, two, or three. I'll give you around 30 seconds, and then we'll close the poll. Yes, giving you more time, okay. Countdown. And then we'll look at the results. Question one. Ooh. Let's see. Uh, interested, but don't know where to start integrating them. That got the most votes. So very few of you said not at all. What do you need to tackle climate justice in your work? And most of you said funding. Funding seems to be the top answer there. <laughs> okay, some said training. And the last question, what are you most excited to learn about today? And Nexus of Climate and Gender Justice got the most votes, 56%. Climate solidarity across movements, 24%. And amplifying grassroots voices, 19%. Thank you for joining this conversation. Let me introduce our panel discussion. So climate change is real. Ice caps are melting, sea levels are rising. And climate change creates economic instability. It aggravates food insecurity. It disrupts infrastructure and it causes displacements. It's affecting every single one of us. But its impact is often greater on the poor and most vulnerable. Indigenous communities, girls, youth and women who make up 70% of the world's poor. Women also make up 80% of those displaced by climate change. Although women are at the heart of this problem, their voices continue to be underrepresented and their efforts inadequately supported. Our discussion here today will focus on the importance of amplifying women's, youth, and other vulnerable groups' voices in climate discussions. And our speakers will also suggest ways in which stakeholders can collaborate and work together, build alliances to support each other in their work to promote climate justice. Without further ado, let's welcome our esteemed panelists. Fiba Tatawaga is from Diva for Equality. Welcome, Viva. Juana Hamisi Singano, or Mishi, is Senior Global Policy Lead, we do. <laughs> Here she comes. Give Mishi a big hand. Hello, Mishi. Zainab Yunusa is Youth Movements and Campaigns Coordinator, Plan International. Zainab. The Honorable Minister Sherry Rahman is Minister of Climate Change of Pakistan. Ooh, she's not here. <laughs> but we have Menka Gundan, Senior Program Manager, Arrow. You can access their full bios on the app. Ladies, welcome. So, Viva, let's begin with you. We know that Diva for Equality has brought in a, a feminist perspective to climate change through their advocacy. How can we ensure that climate policies 
effectively address the specific needs of society's most vulnerable, including, of course, women and girls from marginalized communities. And also, how did DIVA manage to create a space for discussions on the issue of prioritizing gender equality in climate action? Long question. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> but yeah, good morning, everyone. And thank you for being with us this morning. And thank you to our marvelous you. moderator uh, for coordinating with us for the past uh, two months, trying to get us into this uh, discussion right now. Um, I'm, I'll just start with, I'm Viva Tatawanga from Diva for Equality Fiji. And for those of you that uh, don't know yet about DIVA. DIVA is an LBTI-led organization, only one in the Pacific, and we do a lot of work with grassroots women, young women, LGBTQI, and also marginalized groups. And to go back to the question, knowing, having to know that, being an LBTI-led organization and going into this platform where you are really challenging system that is being embedded in patriarchy and is so systemized that is about the top uh, bottom approach. For us, it's always our values and our principles that helps guide us into this work. Um, getting into national level is a different challenge than trying to proceed into regional. And you are, if we are to talk about moving upwards and like you question about how we then bring into a space as such in collaboration, I think it's our values as feminists, as grassroots, as an organization that you're very clear with who you're representing, your constituency, because that helps ground you in the work, regardless that it might get overtiring, mm. regardless the challenges, the backlash. And for us as women with diverse sexual orientation, LBT, it's always an extra effort to try and push to be able to be in these kind of spaces and having this kind of conversation. And I think getting involved into the climate justice we come in with that specific kind of agenda that we cannot talk about cl climate justice without inclusion of gender climate justice and all its other intersectionality. Thank you. Thank you, Viva. I can imagine you face a lot of resistance, but keep up the good work. So, Mishi, you're next. As a leader in global policy advocacy uh, in the areas of women's rights and the health of the planet, You've been advocating for the participation of women in decision-making, including on climate adaptation. What is the potential of investing in women and girls, especially those in marginalized communities? Thank you so much. Uh, and I also want to echo my uh, co-panelist sentiment of working with us. And I have been introduced. My name is Juan Hamisi. I'm from Tanzania. And I work with Women's Environment Development Organization, but I also facilitate and coordinate our work under women and gender constituency. So every time I hear the question about women participation and why do we need women to participate, my quick response is like, why not? We've never asked what's the potential for men, like why women need to justify to provide leadership, yeah? And to ask, to us, as we do and as WGC, we are not looking at women participation because it makes economic sense or because it makes us politi politically correct. We want women participation as the matter of justice. We want women participation because it's fundamental in attaining human rights to the life, a dignified life. So it's really a matter of justice. But to your question, uh, we have been working as we do to track women participation in the UNHCC processes. And the numbers are not good. Why? Because a patriarchal norms, a capitalist mode of production, and of course, a colonialism structure and governance structure and multilateralism has not been designed for women and have not been designed to support women participation. 
And the same structures and system not only created climate crisis, but they limit. They have erected walls and glass ceiling for women not to provide leadership. So our work has been dismantling those structures to make sure that we unchain women and we create spaces so that women leadership can be and should be amplified. And in that case, we have seen women that we have uh, supported, they have provided stellar leadership. We know women have brilliant solutions and have been working to document that. And we have seen women shaping policies and conversation and decision, the gains that we have achieved in the latter scope on loss and damage, part of it has really been uh, led by civil society and women's rights organization. So we know that women participation is the matter of principle, is shifting power. And we want women to take leadership because we are envisioning mm -hmm. a feminist world where it's equal, sustainable, and health for both people and the planet. And that's the potential of having women leadership because they will center well-being of societies and well-being of our planet at the heart of it. So, thank you for that, Mishi. Come on, your Gamati, then we get started. In marginalized uh, community, they're among the most vulnerable, and they're likely to be adversely impacted by climate change. How can youth voices be amplified, and how do we empower youth, and of course other vulnerable groups, to ensure their participation in climate action? Um, thank you very much, Shahira, and I'm very um, privileged to be here. So I, am, I identify as a woman, I am young, well, maybe not by UN standards, I'm 29, but by AU, AU still has me covered and the women deliver. So, and um, yes, young women African, and I listed out these intersecting identities so that you understand that these identities that intersect may place me at a higher risk of you know, being discriminated against. But then I still acknowledge that it is a privilege to be here because I'm trying to answer your question about the vulnerable youth, marginalized community. It happens to be that unfortunately, those voices are excluded from stages such as these main stages. And so I consider myself very privileged to be here, sitting here, um, wanting to talk. And so I will highlight some of those experiences in an attempt to respond to your question. So there is a report by UNFPA last year, and there was a story of um, Ayan Wali, a 24-year-old, in a settlement in Sabadell, I think that's called, forgive my pronunciation, in Ethiopia. Now, Ayan has seven children, stays with her mother-in-law, they were resettled because of the drought in Ethiopia. Now there's been no rainfall for two years. And so there's this, and now Ayan is about to be delivered of a baby. Ayan had to travel 200 kilometers to get a caesarean section done. Now you think Ayan's story is bad. It's not even bad when you, when you start to realize that there are many young girls and women that do not even make it because of labor complications from um, lack of transportation, from displacement by drought, which is climate induced and things like that. There's another report by Plan International on pastoralist communities in Kenya. I think that there's an aspect of it that struck me, and it was the story of Abdiya, a 14-year-old girl. And Abdiya um, shared her sense of fear because saying that by lack of, um, because of the drought, and then when it happens that these pastoralist communities where livelihood come from livestock, when it happens that there is um, maybe no food to feed this livestock, where there's reduced form of livelihood. Abdiya is worried that there is a high chance that she might be married off because, I mean, one less mouth to feed. This is a common saying whenever we're trying to advocate for um, climate justice. Now, she might be married off because 
um, the husband's family at least will cover for the economic burden and pressure that comes to the family. Now there's also the case of the El Nino drought that is happening in uh, Mozambique where because of the limited water supply, young girls and women have had to resort to absorbent plants for, um, for their menstrual health and hygiene to absorb blood. Then you start to imagine what it means to be a youth in a marginalized community and then trying to answer your question, how can those voices be amplified? How can those voices be empowered to ensure their participation in stages like this? I think I don't even have to say so much. The themes of these particular conference answers that question itself. In terms of inclusive spaces, we're talking about... The way we make... Sorry. <laughs> So inclusive spaces, we're talking about solidarity and we're talking about co-creating solutions, by which I mean um, collaborative efforts. Now, there are lots of ways to go about this. I, I saw the poll before we came in and it's, I mean, it shows that we're all here, we know these things. We talk, 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 yes. How about we try and put it into action? I think that's just, that's the way forward to go from here. You know, when we're talking about participation, what can participation look like? It means like challenging injustices to access and inclusion. Now, and I'll just make a case with the, the conference. I appreciate this space. It's very important because we need spaces like this to engage in dialogue with different stakeholders, whether the civil society, government, and all. But how energizing would it have been that in the opening ceremony where we had high-level dignitaries, we had decision makers, there was talk about you, young people, there was talk about the marginalized, but it would have been reassuring and energizing to have a young person be on that panel there to show that there's, it's just creating this space and recognizing that it goes beyond just talking. We know, we understand, but as a young person, what would convince me is being able to be on that stage with a decision maker, having that direct engagement, pouring out my issues, how it affects me, and the kind of solutions that I think would work for me, because I'm the one experiencing it, and relying on the experiences and the support, which can be either material, we've talked about funding here, which can be human, building my capacity, Re making, realizing my ideas. We're talking about knowledge, knowledge resources, like I say, and then just the platform. So there are a lot of ways about what, how meaningful youth engagement can, can come to be, and I'm sure we all have an idea about it. It's just putting it into action, and yeah, let me just stop here. Thank you for sharing the... Oh. Going to start for first time because how many clothing you see just all of those elements you'll start by standing problem thank you hello you can hear me now how many of you I asked are going to leave this room and become a voice for climate. I want to see many hands raised. Please, so we don't just leave this conference and say, I attended a climate justice conference and, and just forget about the matter. And we need more Zainabs on panels like this one, definitely. Menka. As Senior Program Manager, Asia Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, Arrow, can you explain the linkages between sexual and reproductive health rights and climate change? Because they're not clear to some of us. Thank you, Shahira. So, for climate change and SRHR, um, like you said, Usually we don't see that linkage that directly. So in terms of SRHR, 
we are going towards ICPD plus 30, something that we started 30 years ago. So in lead up to that, have we thought about how, say, comprehensive sexuality education, contraceptive use, or even Okay. Even um, access to maternal health, all of these, how does it play out for women and girls living in um, places of climate-induced disasters or climate crisis? Or if you are made to leave your traditional land um, to go elsewhere. So climate refugees and climate um, displaced persons, it does play out. And let me give you two examples on how that happens. In Nepal, studies that Aero has done with its partners, one of the things that we have seen is that partners say that when a climate-induced disaster comes about, and when crops and farms and their economic sources are um, at risk and are taken away and they're economically vulnerable, they take their daughters out of school, either they're made to be married off or they are sent to the urban areas to um, get income for the family or supplement income for the family. That is at the expense of this young woman or girl being taken out of school, not being able to access the curriculum that we fight so hard on comprehensive sexuality education, and then later on in life, because they're not equipped with that knowledge, are not able to make their decisions regarding their bodies and therefore are not able to exercise rights around their bodily autonomy. That is one. In Maldives, what we see is that when, because they are small islands, when there is adverse weather conditions and because of climate change, there is a lot of induced, uh, climate-induced disasters their frequency and their intensity has grown over the years. Women from these islands are not able to access gynecologists if they are pregnant, not able to access SRH services because they are mostly in the main islands. And that is the expense. So we do see increase in pregnancy complications. We do see increase in the lack of contraceptive use. And we do see an increase in um, sexual related and reproductive related cancers. So that is one of the reasons why. Because if we go on to say, oh, you need to have your pep smears, and you can't access even the hospital when you're pregnant and in labor, I think if we backtrack, that's a big ask. So in terms of SRHR, when we are asking women to access their sexual and reproductive rights, this may not be possible because of the type of climate crisis we're in. Um, and, and I like the linkage in terms of the forced marriage as well, because it's not too different for someone in Nepal, someone in Maldives, someone in the Pacific, or even someone in Africa. And, you know, when we were sitting um, at the back, I was having a conversation with Shahira to say that when we're in our own regions, um, I speak here today for my sisters from Asia because I'm doing work in Asia, but I'm also from the Pacific. And, you know, when we are out and when what we see is that our climate crisis, our climate emergency is real 
And so we think, oh, why is someone from Bangladesh making noise about climate? I mean, we have our islands that are disappearing in the Pacific. We're or, all in the same Exactly. Boat. Exactly. And so why is someone from, you know, a landmass like Africa saying that? But what we all need to understand that this is the engineering of capitalism. We are still being divided to think that our issue is important and therefore our sisters who are fighting across the world um, are being pitched against us in terms of the competition of resources. We, need, we must unite and we must go as a global south voice, whether we are in Asia, Pacific or Africa, because climate change is real and it's everywhere. Thank you so much for that. And I believe that sexual and reproductive health services aren't always widely accessible in low and middle income countries. So the problem is bad enough without having climate change make it worse and aggravate it. Viva. Has DIVA's advocacy succeeded in bringing about the needed policy change? We know there's no one size fits all, but can DIVA's advocacy model used in Fiji and the Asia Pacific be replicated in Africa, say, or elsewhere? Thank you, Shaira. Uh, maybe I'll start with coming from a country when you have like 5% of women represented in the parliament and from a region where it's very high violence against women, the rate is very high. So influencing policy may look different from us with from our other family sisters region. So for us, how that has been uh, possible is from a feminist movement approach. So we work with other feminists that uh, we build substantive uh, coalition past years. And once at that point when we are finally grounded ourselves as specific families, having to bring in uh, development agency partners, having to bring in states where they can first just listen to us, build from our um, knowledge and build from uh, with our allies and accomplices in those areas, that could also help us to push to influence uh, policy and making sure that when one of the things that we don't talk about is how feminists move in UN spaces in New York at COP, where we do the back groundwork in making sure that our head of states, people that are going to negotiate on our issues, are having all that they go in with. The drawdown on that on the ground back at home might look different, but we are very clear when we go engage with them in those spaces, we accompany, we provide specific kind of support to make sure that, you know, our representation or our represent representative in those spaces are taken into consideration. And on your question about how do we then make sure that, you know, this is some uh, of the approach that can be uh, shared with other region. I would say that one of the beautiful things that we are trying to do now, and for those of you that were part of our concurrent, Pacific concurrent session yesterday, we kind of little bit show you visually when you have all the women from the Pacific speaking about different issues from decolonization, from uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, from land grabbing, from indigenous rights. And I think that is kind of what we are tapping into now, is that we cannot say that one size fits all, but what we can try push for is that we are using this justice approach work that analysis, which is a double nexus. I will share with you a few, but you can uh, look up in, online on our page and you can learn more about it, which is about, you cannot talk about, you cannot 
try to work towards climate justice or gender climate justice without two sets of work going together, right? You have to make sure that you are bringing in the hum universal human rights approach, you are bringing in SOGISEC issues, you are bringing in the issues of intersectionality, and as far as you want to bring in the conversation about disaster risk reduction, how are we really working towards biodiversity protection and climate and ecological justice. Both of these bangles has to work together. We heard in the plenary, if you were with us at the pre-conference of climate justice, you have heard women who have to self-taught themselves to speak the language of science to speak the language of indigenous policies, that has actually have its both win and oppression over the woman's body. Women have to self-taught themselves to be able to speak economic justice. How many women are in those spaces, in those formal spaces, making sure that gender analysis is included? If we put our hands up and we say like, how many women, it will be devastating to see this. When we go into the spaces of talking about fossil fuel, right? How many women are represented? Are actually their representative is acknowledged in the spaces? The knowledge. If we keep undervaluing and overlooking what women are working on on the ground in the national, regional, and global level, then this work on climate, uh, gender, climate justice has no value because we need women to be in those spaces, then we can have a really predictable policy draw, draw down within our nations. Thank you. Thank you so much for raising those very important points. So we can't, you know, it can't be piecemeal. Justice is justice across the board. And one word that keeps being repeated in almost all of the panels is building coalitions. So in Diva's case, it's civil society reaching out to vulnerable communities. Very important to forge those alliances if we want to effect real change at the grassroots level. Mishi, the intersectionality of uh, gender and climate justice is crucial for building an inclusive, equitable movement. So how can we promote collaboration and solidarity between different social justice movements to address the challenges faced by women, girls, and vulnerable groups in particular? Thank you so much. Uh, and I think this is the sort of like perfect segue. We, as we do, we do work primarily in building collective power. So within uh, our organization and our team, we believe and we are very intentional not to replicate the same system of extraction and inclusion that we are seeing in the outside world. Today, for example, the UNHCRC decision not necessarily speaks to the UNDRR or Sendai framework, not necessarily speaks, for example, to decisions that have been done in the CSW. So we have been advocating for coherence between UN system, and we are very intentional that our movement doesn't replicate that. So because of that, we have been intentional in building horizontal uh, movement, and that is, for example, if you are in Tanzania, you are working on climate justice movement, we are very intentional to support you to connect with the gender movement. We are very intentional to support you with the uh, SRHR movement so that we believe women don't live single life and our issue cannot be single life. So it's really important to build that horizontal movement cross theme, cross, cross region, but also connecting them uh, vertically. So, for example, we coordinate WGC, which is, uh, is at global level, but we are intentional now to create a regional platform where this movement from countries can meet at regional level and share those issues. Building movement is not easy. We have been doing this work, and we know it's not easy. We don't have a perfect system, but I can share three main recipes that has worked for us. One is really respecting diversity and knowing diversity is a gift and not a challenge. 
we are who we are because we are different. So embracing the differences within us make our movement stronger. Second, and how many of you agree with that? Give her a hand. My reality as an African woman is different to the reality of Pacific women, is different to the reality of European women. And no reality is better than the other. It's, it's important to embrace diversity as a gift because we complement each other. So the second, as I said, is really have a shared ideology and a vision. If we don't have a shared uh, ideology, we cannot keep movement. It's easy to pull people together. It's hard work to maintain them in that space. And you can only do that when we all know and convinced we are going on the same path. You can have different tools, you can use different strategies, you can bring different capacities to the movement, but we all know you are doing this because we all share the same journey. So having clarity on the vision and the principles and the Ideology is key of keeping movement. And last but not least, respectful and dignified participation is really critical. We have seen women and women's organization getting to the movement or to the space and live traumatized, live feeling that they have been used, leave those movements feeling that they have been abused. So it's really important to have respectful and dignified participation in our movement and in the spaces. So to me, those are three main ingredients and we welcome all of you to join Women and Gender Constituency if you, you are at any corner of this world, but if you if are in Africa, to join African CSW, I mean Africa Women Gender Constituency, and if you are in the MENA region, this year COP will be housed in the MENA region. So if you are in the MENA region, WGC really wants your leadership because to us, it doesn't make sense for women from Africa to come to Dubai and to provide leadership while we have feminists in the region who can do that work. And that is what solidarity means and that's what building cross-movement means. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mishi. Amazing. The key words, diversity, dignity, respect, and focus perhaps on the commonalities because it is a shared challenge. Our last question is for you, Zainab. Would you say that perceptions are changing with regards to engaging youth, women, and other vulnerable groups in climate decision-making? Is this happening slowly and also what strategies or approaches have you seen that amplify the voices of the most vulnerable in the context of climate action? I mean, yes, just going directly to that, it's changing. I mean, we're making positive changes, happening very slowly. We could move faster, but it's happening at a very slow pace. And in terms of the strategies to be inclusive, everything Mishi has said, Everything Mishi has said is what we need to incorporate. And then um, I will just say one aspect or one, one uh, strategy or approach that has worked very specific to climate decision making and inclusion of young people, girls and young women, is still going back to what Mishi has said in terms of collaborative work. So there is, um, in the UNFCCC, which is the UN framework for climate, a convention of climate change, there are nine constituencies of civil society that try to influence decision making, which is where, um, the one, of, one of which is the women and gender constituency, of which I am a very proud member too. And, but before joining the women and gender constituency, I started off from the youth constituency. Now it's called Yongo. It is um, the formal coordinating body of youth NGOs and individuals. Now, Yongo is made up of over 10,000 individuals from across the world and over 1,000 youth NGOs, whether youth-led initiatives, interventions, and it's a recognized body a formal structure there in the UNFCCC. And a strategy that I've seen that work is how Yongo has been able to influence 
like direct policy making at the international, at the most global le level. You see young people being um, recognized in consultation, influencing decision making, drafting statements as to what kind of demands they want to see out of negotiations. We see young people clamoring for um, awareness for capacity building to be part of official delegations uh, of official national delegations of their country demanding for certain quota demanding for training demanding for mentorship and we're seeing that these um, our voices are being heard in some way I mean I said it is slow but what we're seeing is that there is the recognition of that space for young people for instance the COP27 in Egypt, it happened to be that there was a youth pavilion that was created, similar to what is here, that was created for young people. And it wasn't only, it wasn't that this space was just created. Young people demanded it and they co-created every event, every activity that happened in that space. So that pavilion was owned by young people. It was co-created. And I think what I'm driving on is to say, Engagement is one part. We need to move forward from just engaging to co-designing, co-creating, and young people co-owning these spaces. And I think that is what would actually make us move faster. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zainab. So how are we doing for time? I think I can squeeze in one last question for Menka. How can collaboration between SRHR workers or actors and those working on climate change be enhanced? Sorry, we already have begun that process. Um, we have what we call the SRHR and Climate Justice Coalition. Um, and through the coalition, we are making a, um, a collective effort to move towards spaces that are scientific and traditional to climate justice actors and not as feminists who are working on um, gender and SRHR issues. So that's a collective effort that we are making. Um, we also are looking at multi um, UN agencies uh, in terms of you know, making that collaboration and that connection um, so that we are able to be heard in the UNFCCC spaces um, at the COP, but also in Bonn every year for the special body reporting. One of the things I also want to say, whilst we've all talked about how we move in these spaces, uh, but also in the frame of dignity, we are, and one of the realities is that as women's rights activists, as feminists, we are tired. And we are tired because we are going into spaces without the resources that everyone else has. So when we go to COP and we see the fossil fuel companies in their more fancy pavilions with their, uh, you know, with more than million dollars, et cetera, to spend, which we can only dream of, we are tired even when we reach this space because we also don't have that type of resource to take care of ourselves. And when we are talking about SRH, that is an important factor as well on how we are sustaining our movement in a dignified way. Because we continue to lose great activists and feminists because of the work we have done for years and because we don't have the same type of resources, we hear about these resources, we hear about commitments of resources, but where does this resource go? to the large corporations. Exactly. <laughs> so profiting from that you know and that's the reason why we are tired. Because we are constantly being put on the battleground, yet we say that our bodies are not battlegrounds. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Please give a big hand to these amazing ladies. Thank you so much. And I'll wrap up with the takeaways at the end of the session, not right now, but many thanks to all of you. You may leave the stage if you want. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Missy. <laughs> right. So, time now for our next segment, and it's our fire starter talk. She was just seven years old when she attended a UN disaster conference in Mongolia. Uh, she went there with her father in 2018. This inspired her to get involved in activism. She later told the BBC, I got lots of inspiration and new knowledge from the speakers there. It was a life-changing experience for her. Now she's here to inspire and educate. Lisipriya Kangujan, activist and founder of the Child Movement. Lissy. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Kurum Jari Namaste. Good morning, Ravanda, or do we say what I'm going to say, Ravanda? <laughs> Thank you, Ravanda. Thank you, Women Deliver. Thank you, Dr. Maliha Khan. Thank you, Fumzila, ma'am. Thank you, Veronica, ma'am. And thank you, everyone here, for inviting me to speak in this wonderful event. I'm also very thankful to the government of Rwanda for the wonderful hospitality and the immense welcome to this beautiful land of Rwanda. My name is Lissipriya Kangucham. I am 11 years old. I'm an Indian clan activist and founder of the child movement. I'm also fighting to save our planet and our future. I'm also the special envoy for the president of Timor Leste. It has been over five years now. I'm fighting to save our planet and our future, to pass the climate change law in the Indian parliament, to make climate education mandatory in every school education curriculum, to make sure that every school children plants minimum 10 trees every year to pass their final examinations. Last month, over hundreds of people died due to intense heat waves in the northern region of India. And now again, over hundreds of people's death in the last two weeks due to severe flash floods and landslides in the Himalayan region of northern India. In summers, we face the intense heat wave crisis, and in winters, we face extreme high air pollution level in India. And these are all the impacts of climate change. But do you know what our leaders are doing on it? They are doing nothing. They are just blaming each other instead of finding a long-term solution. They will come and give a few kgs of rice and sugar. And that's the solution. That's all they know. And when disasters strike, have you ever heard that the rich people are ever dead? Most of the victims are those poor innocent people, poor women and children. We the children and young women don't know where to go and for how long. We the young children and the women are the first line of victims. And our leaders must know this. I'm coming here to tell the rich country nations to pay for the loss and damage caused by the climate crisis to the global south. <laughs> to 
Today's climate crisis is caused by those rich country nations and we are just the victims of it. We had enough of suffering. We deserve climate justice now. Africa deserves climate justice now. Children are dying due to war in Ukraine. Children are dying due to earthquake in Turkey and Syria. Children are dying due to high air pollution level and intense heat wave crisis in India. Children are dying due to flash floods in Pakistan. Children are dying due to starvation in Ethiopia. And many girl children are out of school to fetch water from a very long distance in Africa. Millions of children like me are losing their lives, losing their parents and their homes due to climate disasters. I'm sacrificing the lives of those millions of innocent children for the failures of our leaders is unacceptable at any cost. And instead of spending billions of dollars on wars, if we spend it on ending poverty, giving education and fighting climate change, then what a wonderful place our Earth would be. As for various reports, 40% of our insect population has gone. 69% of our animal species has gone. 69% of our forest has gone and 40% of our Himalayan glaciers has gone. There is no mystery to widespread vanishing species because we are the cause. There are too many of us demanding too much from our mother nature, but we should remember that we are the top protector. That's why I started child movement in India with many children to defend our planet. There is a long history of lies by our leaders. That's why our planet is in an irreparable damage today. If there is no nature, then there will be no food. If there's no nature, then there will be no growth. If there's no nature, then there will be no security. And if there's no nature, then there will be no future for us. Don't forget why are we here today. We are not here to give some few minute speeches to get some claps from the audience. We are here to demand climate justice from you all. And our future lies in your hands now. And the forest belonging to the indigenous tribal people like Amazon rainforest in Brazil, Hastio forest in Chhattisgarh, are sold out by our leaders to huge coal mining companies. Not just destroying our planet and our future, it snatched away the rights of those indigenous people. This is unacceptable at any cost. And deforestation must be an international crime. Latest IPCC report says that climate crisis is caused by human activities, but it's really caused by our leaders due to lack of political will. Small island countries like Maldives are submerging inside the sea. Many rivers and lakes are now dry and dead. Frequent cyclones are devastating our homes. And wildfires are killing millions of animal species every year. Habitats of countless and voiceless animals are now being used for mining. And many forests has been transformed into deserts. This is not the change we want. And if you don't know how to fix it, then please stop breaking it. Our leaders 
still don't panic about the climate crisis. What they panic is throwing a tomato soup on a sunflower aunt and arresting, silencing the voice of climate activists. There is no value of an expensive art, luxurious car, or a beautiful home on a dead planet. We must hold the lawmakers accountable for their political decisions. And climate education must be mandatory in every school education curriculum of the world to fight the climate crisis from the grassroots. There will be no climate solution without climate education. Our governments must work together to manage a just transition away from coal, oil and gas, which are the top causes of today's global climate crisis. And rich countries must pay now for the loss and damage to the poor developing nations. There will be no climate justice without climate finance. I have a dream where there are more bicycles on roads instead of more motor vehicles. I have a dream where there is no coal power plants and thermal power plants and is replaced by clean and renewable energies. I have a dream where all the children living in this world have the access to clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, and clean planet to live. And asking clean air to breathe, clean water to drink, and clean planet to live is all our basic rights. Climate change problem is not only for me or for you or for someone else. Climate change problem is for every single person living in this world. And each and every child living in this country, living in this world, are already the victims of climate change. That's why I'm fighting to save our planet and our future. Your action today will decide our future tomorrow. My generation is already the victims of climate crisis. I don't want the future generations to face the same consequences again due to your inaction and empty false promises. And the best gift parents can give to their children it's not a beautiful house, expensive cars, or a lot of money. The best gift parents can give to their children is a beautiful green planet. We just need to change our behavior to save our planet. Change means empowerment. Empowerment means independence, and independence means freedom. Freedom is when you can protect your land and environment. Freedom is when you can protect your children's future, culture, and health. Freedom is when you can read and write. Freedom is when you're out of hunger. Freedom is when no one can discriminate you on the base of caste, creed, color, sex, or any other differences. Freedom is when we are all together in this fight. Fight for your freedom. Thank you, Jai Hind, Sanaliba, Manipur, Nayafri. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. My breath away. Listen, Priya Kangujan, let's all work collectively to make Lissy's dream come true. It takes a child's voice to move mountains, and this generation is going to change the world.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Lizzie. you so much, everyone. Thank you, Mom. Right. Coming up next is our intergenerational fireside chat with three equally remarkable speakers. And they've been brought to us courtesy of the Project Dandelion, a women-led campaign fighting for climate justice. Please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Her Excellency Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland and chair of the elders. Mary Robinson. Hafsat Abiola, human rights, civil rights and democracy activist. Welcome. And Vanessa Nakati, she's climate justice activist and founder of the Youth for Future Africa and the Africa-based Rise Up movement. <laughs> Ladies, it's such an honor to have you with us here today. So let me start by asking you, after all you've heard, how many of you are now committed to work for climate justice? Let's see if there's a difference from the numbers from before. Wow. Yeah, I, don't, I want to see everyone's hand raised here in the room. Your Excellency, let's start with you. Um, we hear a lot about climate justice and we hear a lot about gender justice. So in a practical sense, what do we mean by these terms? Because climate justice is a relatively nascent concept that's not fully understood. Well, thank you, Shahira. And I must say, I am so pleased because we don't always hear talk about climate justice and gender justice. It's not something people always talk about. We've had such brilliant panels. And the fact that an 11-year-old can stand up and have such wisdom and such understanding of where our world is, um, I think, uh, if I may answer your question in a slightly different way, uh, the discussion before has brought out the intersectionality between reproductive health and rights, gender equality, climate. This is all part of climate justice, has been from the beginning, because it's based on the injustices, that it affects the poorest countries, poorest communities, small island states, indigenous peoples, much earlier, much harder, and they're not responsible. And then within that, of course, women and girls. And then the intergenerational um, injustice and the, the injustice to nature. So this is all there. But what I wanted to really build on everything we've heard up to now in this wonderful morning, um, we're in a paradox because we are on the cusp of a clean energy, safe climate world. We're almost there. We could do it quite easily, but paradoxically, we're heading for catastrophe. Uh, by which I mean, if you add up all the pledges and promises that governments have made around the world, together with what the corporate sector is doing, what investment is doing, what entrepreneurs are doing, what everybody's doing, if you add it all up, we are still heading at best for a 2.4 degree world this century, which is catastrophe catastrophe. We see the heat now, made worse by El Nino. Beyond two degrees, the world will become unlivable. This is crazy. Now, why is it like that? It's like that because money is being made out of fossil fuel, and four billion a year is spent on a communications campaign. And we don't have any similar communications campaign properly on the other side. We rely on those who are working hard on climate justice on the ground to somehow communicate to the whole world what they're doing. They can't do it. They, have, they need communication support. So what Project Dandelion is, is about is a communications campaign with a symbol. Can I just tell you before you pass on yes. just why this symbol? You'll see a number of people wearing the dandelion um, around the hall, including uh, Pat Mitchell there in the front row, who was one of the founders with Hafsat and Rhonda Carnegie of the Connected Women Leaders. Um, we were looking for 
something different from a moonshot of, jo of John Kennedy, which was very male, very technical. And we came up with this feminist earth shot. The dandelion is the only flower that, or weed that's on all seven continents. It's very um, strong in itself. Um, it's very hard to get rid of. It's very resilient. Okay. Um, <laughs> thirdly, <laughs> you could eat every part of it in soups and in teas. I think, and then the roots can actually help with toxins that modern living wow. brings to our bodies. And how do you spread it? Yeah. So we think this can be a framework that everybody that's already working on climate justice, working so hard on the right side of things, we can gather our strength. So that's what I wanted to begin with. So. <laughs> yes, we want everyone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> thank you, Your Excellency. Oh, um, no, you have to call me Mary in the future. OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hafsat, you next. And how does climate change intersect with gender equality in your view? And what are the implications for sustainable development? Also, how can climate action be leveraged to advance women's rights? Okay, how can climate action be leveraged to advance women's rights? You know, the very first, first of all, thank you so much for convening um, and to uh, Malia of um, Women Deliver for hosting us. Um, the truth is, the world we're in, and the first panel, and Lizzie spoke very clearly about this, the world we're in is de designed in a particular way, and it gives money, it gives power, to very limited people. Take, for example, agriculture. Women are the principal farmers all over the world. They're, about 60, they're responsible for about 65% of food production, but they only own 10% of land. And in that way, they're, um, they're able to feed the world, but can hardly find enough money to take care of themselves. That's the current system that we're in. The climate crisis gives us a new opportunity. With the climate crisis, depending on how we look to solve it, we can begin to redress injustice in terms of ownership of land. We can look to redress injustice in terms of access to energy. There's so many steps that we can take but the truth is, the kinds of solutions that are being put on the table at this time, technical solutions, solutions that are being developed by the big companies in the world who have the money for research and development, tells us that if we allow them to define how we respond to the climate crisis, all the injustices around the world will not be solved. Let me say very clearly, before you are clapping, please wait. The truth is, there was a study that was done, and it looked at boys and looked at girls. It looked at boys and it looked at girls in, in nursery school. It was a US study. What did they find? They gave them pencils, and the boys would look at their pencils and try to decide who had the better pencil. My pencil is longer. My pencil is sharper. My pencil is bigger. They gave girls the pencils. Please ask me or tell me what the girls did with their pencils. The girls started saying, they were trying to establish what was the same about their pencils. Look. It's, we all have yellow pencils. Look, our pencils are all the same length. They were trying to establish commonality, common ground. I've worked for over 25 years. Today, this year, it will be 25 years exactly 
that I've been an activist. I became an activist by default. That was not the plan. There was a gorgeous guy I was dating, and he lived down the road from my family house. The intention was to marry him, and I wanted to walk to see my parents. But my father then had this dream. He wanted to be president of my country. He ran for office at a time of military rule. They put him in jail. And my mom, who was a high school graduate, stood up because her husband was in jail and started to fight. I can date exactly the years of my activism because after standing up and organizing the oil workers union that provided the government with 80% of its revenues to go on a long three month strike, the longest strike in my country, even in world history, by all workers demanding democracy for my country. The soldiers of my country ambushed my mother's car on the 4th of June and gunned her down. With my mother's death, I received with her death as she was leaving this earthly plane. I felt a spirit. A spirit wanted to turn back and give me instructions tell me how to look after the younger siblings, tell me how to take up the cause. And then she said to herself, there's no need to turn back. Hafsat will know what to do. But I promise you that it was the assassination of my mother that was the invitation for me to stand up. And it's like that for many women. Women only stand up to fight when they have a reason. They don't just fight for power. They fight for power because of something. Three years ago, this woman came to us at Connected Women Leaders. We convened women leaders around the world. She came to us. We wanted to work on food security, health access, feminist leadership, climate. And she said to us, all those issues must take a back seat to the climate crisis. She then invited us to make climate and our response to climate crisis a priority. She invited us. And today, all of you in this room, all of you in this room, Whatever the issue you are working on, whatever the cause, noble as it is, let me put before you that same invitation. We want you standing on behalf of climate, but why? Without climate, nothing else can work. Now I'm tearing up. <laughs> that was very moving and very true. And remember what I told you at the beginning of this session, that women at the heart of the climate crisis can come up or are likely to come up with the smartest and most innovative solutions. So many women in this room and they can all become the voices for climate action. Vanessa, so what role can youth-led movements like Youth for Future Africa play in driving transformative climate action? Um, thank you so much. Well, it's very hard to define a role that we are already doing as young people from different parts of the world. I've been organizing with Fridays for Future and Rise Up Movement to raise awareness on the impacts of the climate crisis you know, across the world. And like you've heard from my fellow panelists, um, the climate crisis is happening right now and it's affecting the lives of so many people, especially communities that are, you know, not responsible for this crisis. And that's the need to talk about climate justice. We know, you know, 
like the African continent, historically it is responsible for less than 4% of global emissions. And yet we are seeing some of the worst impacts of the climate you know, crisis. So what, you know, young people across the world have already been raising awareness for years. And it's really very hard for me to say that this is the role of young people because, you know, we've been organizing, we've been mobilizing, and we've been educating. So the question is, what is the role of our leaders in ensuring that we have a better future, a safer future, and a healthier planet for all of us? So to just really add on what my fellow panelists have said, it's important that everyone in this space, not just young people, comes together to work together to ensure that we have a better environment for all of us. It's important to note that, um, you know, uh, the climate crisis won't just impact young people, it will impact all of us. It's already impacting the lives of so many people, so many girls and women that are being, that are disproportionately affected. So it's really important that we all come together as a global community to address the greatest you know, threat facing our lives right now. So I'm from Egypt and I'm reading terrifying uh, forecasts that Alexandria may actually be underwater in like 30 years. It's terrifying. Uh, awareness is very important, but how can we better support and empower young climate activists like yourself? Well, um, I think that for many young activists, um, I think that many young people are overwhelmed by, you know, the threat of the climate crisis and also overwhelmed by, by the inaction. So I think we need, we need, um, we need you to take care of us in a, you know, in a much better way and We'll give you a moment to think about that. I wish the emotions in this room can be, you know, can be transferred to the, those that care less or are, you know, not taking any action. Thank you for that, Vanessa. Mary, what are the barriers to effective intergenerational collaboration in climate governance and policy making? Shahira, if you don't mind, I'm not going to take about, talk about the barriers, I'm going to talk about the solution. Please. <laughs> <laughs> because actually, Project Dandelion is the solution. Look at Vanessa, she's been working on this, she's stressed how many other young climate activists in the world are absolutely stressed? They've been carrying the burden. Look at that 11-year-old carrying that burden. Um, what we need is a movement. Um, a movement needs a symbol. We've got the perfect symbol of this wonderful weed that's very resilient, that you can eat every part of, that poets write about, and how you spread it. We need to connect the climate movements that exist the youth climate movement that Vanessa's part of, and that so many other young, including on the panel that you had on earlier, wonderful young um, woman, um, they're there, but they don't get enough linkage and support. Indigenous peoples have been there before us with their wisdom, are there still begging us to listen and to do what's right. Um, we have a whole civil society, and many of you here are part of that that is trying. We have progressive business. I belong to the B team of business leaders that are heads of major companies, and they are as serious as I am about the crisis. And they want to get out of fossil fuel, because that's the problem. The problem is that the fossil fuel lobby spends four billion pounds, or dollars a year messing up the whole climate science, um, pretending 
that they're on the clean energy side, but they're not actually. They are a bit, but actually they make more money. They make billions from fossil fuel. If they meant move to clean energy, they'd only make millions, and that doesn't do, you know, billions is what they want. Now, we have to realize, and Al Gore is very eloquent on this, that we are up against a huge communications campaign. And on our side, there isn't one. There isn't a global communications campaign about the right kind, bottom up, about what's really happening and who's helping to change on the ground and build the resilience. And why isn't the investment going much more to that? So we feel that Project Dandelion can be that kind of communications campaign movement that links everyone. I saw it before the Paris Agreement. I saw the way that indigenous peoples, civil society, we marched in the street, 1.5 to stay alive. But actually, the governments weren't agreeing to 1.5. And there was only one voice, because I was the special envoy of the Secretary General, I was in on the discussions. The voice was um, Tony de Brum, foreign minister, yeah, good cheer for Tony. Tony de Brum, the foreign minister of the Marshall Islands, he said, do you want our people to no longer be sovereign? Do you want us to go underwater? Is that what you want? And then when we went into the Paris conference, a high ambition coalition was formed, led by Tony de Brum. It brought in the European Union, it eventually brought in the United States, and they had one goal, to get 1.5 in the text. And that was the force of a lobby. The problem at the moment is democratic leaders are serious about climate now, but they're serious about it adding on to, you know, we must make change now because yes, climate is happening, but it's not a crisis because they don't feel the crisis from the bottom up. We have to persuade through a conviction that we're in an absolute crisis and we're in a total patriarchal mess and we have to change the world very dramatically um, and quickly. And we can and we will. And the best thing about our Connected Women leaders is the wisdom of one of our indigenous members, Jade Bigay. I think, is Jade here? Um, I think she was, I'm not sure, I was hoping she was coming to the conference. Anyway, Jade said at our, one of our, our, when we were talking about this Project Dandelion, she said, in our tribe in New Mexico, we have a question to ourselves. And a lot of indigenous people ask this, what if our best times are ahead of us? What if our best times are ahead of us? And they are. If we can just get over this hump, if we can get to a clean energy, fairer, more equitable world, where everybody has access to clean energy, where everybody can have the possibilities of fully developing their potential, that's what Project Dandelion wants to do. We want to be the connecting tissue to make this happen. So we need a counter-communication campaign, uh, as you said, Mary. What would the key messages be of that campaign? Um, the key messages would be stop subsidizing fossil fuel. Um, it's harming us. Stop it. Shift the money to clean energy, especially for developing countries, to let them have, because they've got the sun, many of them have wind, thermal, other forms of energy, but they need the, they need the investment to move rapidly. We need them to move rapidly. Let have more money for those who are building resilience on the ground, especially women. I mean, only 2% of funding, um, climate funding, goes to what women are doing on the ground. All the women farmers that Hafsat has referred to. So um, we, we, we're very clear, but also we're very clear about messaging that will create this crisis person, personal movement. I've seen it in my own country, Ireland. We had a conference recently where the local met the national. The national isn't doing enough. Ireland is not on track. Ireland has good climate legislation, part of the European Union, should be reducing our Irish emissions by 50%, which will go up to 55%, and it should. Do you know what we're on course for? 29%. Why? Because the, the ministers don't feel the pressure to take those hard decisions now and really, really, really move. It's not a crisis. And so we need to build the Project Dandelion movement that every individual feels the crisis, talks the crisis to their neighbor, to their workmates, and then takes it up the, the, the thing to those who have decisions, and in particular, takes on the fossil fuel lobby. We have to phase out fossil fuel now. Uh, phase it out, not phase it down. Phase it out.
and we have to move very rapidly to this clean energy, safe climate world, which Project Dandelion will lead us to. But we also need a shift away from fear to hope. Yes. Clean energy yeah. is the hope. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Mary. Uh, one last question for you, Vanessa. Uh, Hafsat, sorry, Hafsat. So how do we overcome these barriers to foster meaningful partnerships between different generations in addressing climate challenges? If you're over 60 years old, could you please stand up? Over, over 60 years old, could you please stand up? The first woman to stand up, Pat Mitchell. I call her Mama Pat. Oh, my sister Liz. Okay, please stand, over 60, please stand. There are not many in this room, but they've stood. Okay, let's say over 50, please stand. Oh, no, no, still over, over 50, please stand. Oh, okay, yes, your hand is up, thank you. But stand, 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 because we're gonna be on the streets marching soon. You can stand now, come on, stand up. All the young people in this room, look around you and see all of us. Oh, my sister, thank you for standing. God bless you. I didn't know. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You know, all the young people, all these people over 50, look at them and know this. Vanessa, know this. It honors all of us to support you young people. All these young people, Mama Pat, Mama Pat was, um, she's one of the founders of Connected Women Leaders. She's actually the primary founder and she pulled Rhonda Carnegie and myself to join her. She was president of public broadcasting um, television in America for 12 years in the leadership of television. She knows pretty much and every, anybody, who, everybody with anybody in America, she knows, and all over the world. And she has been using our connections to fight. Keep standing, keep standing. <laughs> she has been using our connections to fight for this issue. Because we know, how old, I'm going to, I'm going to be 49 this year. How many more years do I have? But the world is for you, Vanessa. It's for all the young people. Just know that it honors all of us to support you guys. It honors us. We want you to be brave and fight and go, and we will accompany you. We will support you, whatever you need. In the years and the, the decades ahead, you can sit now. <laughs> but I want to say one more thing. Young people, we want you to stand and fight this fight. We will support you. We will put everything we have to support you. But we want you to fight this fight because the world is yours. In a few decades, we won't be here. In fact, um, one of our members already is facing the last, maybe last months. And even now, even now, facing maybe days, maybe weeks, according to what we've been told. She, she met with Mama Pat just two days ago on the way Mama Pat was flying America through London to um, Kigali. She met with her and she was still talking about the climate crisis and how to develop documentaries that would raise awareness. Even now, we will put everything on the line for you. But you young people have to take the baton from us. You don't need to wait from, for us because we are kind of getting slow. We're older. You're younger, you're more innovative. You can take charge, you can lead. We will support you. And when you start leading, you will see that sometimes you don't get it perfectly right. That's fine. The world is yours, you can keep going. You have every right to make mistakes. But fight this battle, because you see, we were told that they were going to make a beautiful world, that there was the American dream, but we know that it was built on the blood and sacrifice of so many that have never been compensated. 
we were told that um, there was going to be this Western civilization that would come to Africa. But if you go just next door to Cong Congo, they will tell you that 20 million Congolese died in the era of colonization because of this um, Western civilization coming. You know, there's been many false dreams that have been sold. The safe climate world is a real possible, the only real true dream we can have now. You know, there was this guy in um, Star Trek, he was flying out of the planet. Um, you know, they were always going in Star Trek to discover new worlds. But one time he actually had a real opportunity to get into a rocket and fly into the galaxy. And as he was flying, he said he realized that he was almost flying through a graveyard. There was no life in all these other planets. And when they turned back and started coming to the planet Earth, he realized that this planet is the only true home we have. So all of the young people and older people, this intergenerational um, um, solidarity that we must show each other is because we're all we have. We're the only thing standing between the planet and disaster. So I want all of us to be brave and to do whatever we need to do to make that difference. And the last thing I will say to you is, I'm gonna ask all of you, are you ready? When I ask, what's your answer? I want you to say instead, born ready. I'm gonna ask you, are you ready? I want you to say, born ready. Are you ready? Bold ready. Are you ready? Bold ready. Are you ready? Thank you. feeling determined and inspired. But my one worry is that the room is full of women and very few men. And I think that men should have been listening to this conversation. Well, you know, we, we absolutely want to include men and boys um, in this um, movement that yes. is very light touch. Everybody can continue doing the excellent work they're doing that is not climate related. Because here in this room, we have those who are mainly focused on climate, I'm glad to say. But in Women Deliver, the 6,000 members here, I would say certainly less than half, maybe less than a quarter, would feel the same sense of urgency we feel in this room, the urgency that Vanessa lives every day and works so hard on. Um, we need everybody to feel this urgency because we have to um, push the mainly men who make the decisions. That's why the world is in such a mess. The patriarchy is in such a mess. Um, we have to fault. move them and replace them. Get more women in. <laughs> I think and we have to do it now. <laughs> our fight together, everyone. Vanessa, are you ready now? Last words from you. Yeah, what is um, your message to everyone gathered here today? Well, um, my message is that we need to do everything we can to ensure that our planet, our home, is protected. And we need to make sure that those that are on the front lines of the climate crisis are protected. Because we know that so many communities are not only losing their livelihoods, but people are also losing their lives. I have seen that in some of the communities that I've visited. And it's very hard when you hear these stories, when you hear these experiences, experiences of pain, of struggle, of suffering, of agony, from children, from women, from people in these communities. It is very hard because you're hearing all these stories from different people, but they are coming to you as one person. And you feel you need to help. You feel like you want to help but you don't know how to help. You don't know how to help all of them. And I think that is the challenge that so many young people face, is that they see the urgency of the crisis. We see you know, how climate change is affecting so many people. We've seen people who have lived it. We've seen people you know, who have lost families, who have lost cultures, who have lost their homes, who have lost their sources of income. 
and we feel like we want to help. We feel like we need to help, but we don't know how to. We sometimes feel like we, don't, we are not doing enough to ensure that these people are listened to, that their voices, their experiences are listened to, and that they get the support that they need. And we've, we get, you know, we get a lot of pressure to show up and keep sharing these stories to keep talking about stories of pain and suffering, and yet we see no action. What we really want is that when we share these stories, that there is action, that there is justice for these communities, so that we don't have to go back to these communities and hear these stories again and again. We need to ensure that these problems are not passed on from generation to generation because that is what is happening right now. The same challenge that children are facing right now, it is the same that their parents faced, the same that their grandmothers faced, and we are continuing in that and same... Soon there will be no next generation if we continue at this pace. Yeah, that is why it is important for our leaders to get serious about the climate crisis, and that means no new fossil fuel investment to ensure that people's lives are protected and the planet is protected as well. We need massive scale up of renewable energy, especially in the communities that are already experiencing energy poverty. We know that in the African continent alone, 600 million people in sub-Saharan Africa don't have basic access to electricity, and yet all we hear about is the energy crisis in Europe. So we need to ensure that those that have been struggling with energy poverty, those ha that have been struggling with the climate crisis, those that carry roots and history of slavery and colonialism, get the justice that is needed. Because you find that the same communities which experience slavery, colonialism, that are the same communities that are being extracted, that are the same communities that are facing the worst impacts of the climate crisis, that are the same communities that are experiencing the worst challenges of this life in this planet. So we have to ensure that those that have been suffering, we are not doing this just for us. We are doing it for those who, who have lost their lives already. We are doing it for those who are suffering right now who could lose their lives we are doing this for the coming generations we are also doing this for our generation our planet is in a crisis the earth is in danger and we need our leaders to act right now we need them to act like the leaders that were elected. Because when le I know how politicians work, when they are looking for votes, they make promises. They need to keep up with these promises. They need to ensure that people are protected and the planet is protected. That is the essence of climate justice. When we talk about climate change, climate change is more than weather. It's more than statistics. It is more than data points. It is about the people. It is about life. It is about blood. So if we are to talk about climate action, climate action shouldn't just be about us putting solar panels. It shouldn't just be about us planting trees. It, we should ensure, I'm sorry, we should ensure that the quality of the lives of the people is improved, especially the people that are on the front lines of this crisis. People I'm sorry, just one minute. Uh, have to leave it there. The people <laughs> that... <laughs> the people that have been invaded and that have suffered with all the cry... When you think about most of the challenges that we've seen on this planet, it's the same people, it is the same communities that are still healing, healing from histories of pain, healing from histories of suffering, that the same communities battling with the climate crisis that is affecting their livelihoods, that is affecting their cultures, that is affecting their lives, that could affect their children and the children to come. This is the urgency that we want the leaders to understand. And that's why it's important for all of us here, our sisters, 
brothers, our mothers, grandmothers in this place. We need all of you to carry the message of the climate crisis in whatever you do, because there is no, you know, there is no climate justice without ensuring that people are protected. And if we don't address the climate crisis, we may never be able to solve all the challenges that women and girls are facing across the world. An impassioned plea from Vanessa. Vanessa Mary Hafsat, I can't thank you enough for the inspiration. Please look up our website, www.projectdandelion.com. Join us. Thank you. You've won many converts today. Thank you. Thank you, Hafsat. So, very quickly, the takeaways from the discussion. Climate justice needs more than pledges. Without accountability, grassroots initiatives and feminist movements will not get resources to scale. There's a major awareness gap, and there's an untapped potential to mobilize women, youth, indigenous communities who, once informed, can get involved and take bold action. Are you ready? <laughs> We need more inclusive policies that address the needs and rights of vulnerable groups to foster a more equitable climate movement. And we need a people-centered approach. Humanity is the missing element in unifying the climate conversation. Finally, there needs to be collaboration and solidarity among and across movements and generations to enhance collective efforts, bridging divides and forging partnerships between stakeholders is key to achieving climate justice. Also what Hafsat said, there's no challenge we cannot meet with persistence, determination and believing in our capabilities, we can overcome the challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, we still have one more speaker, and our last speaker is the Vice President of Palau, lawyer, Judge Udu Sengabal. Please welcome her. Udu Sengabal Sr. Vice President of Palau. Good morning. Honorable ministers, your excellencies, development partners and donors, distinguished delegates, a warm Pacific greeting to you all. Thank you to our speakers this morning from across the globe, contributing their incredible knowledge, insights, and experiences to this plenary five session, mobilizing for change, advancing climate and gender justice as one. There has been an impressive depth of discussion throughout today's moderated panel, Firestarter Talk and the Intergenerational Talk. I feel privileged and honored to provide the closing remarks on behalf of our speakers and all involved in this session and to stand before you, a crowd of so many inspiring and diverse people gathered here for the Women Deliver Conference, and to add a special acknowledgement to the strong, committed women environmental defenders who defend us, other species, and the living planet. I say this 
as an indigenous Palawan woman, a woman born and living in the Pacific Islands, a region a quarter of the planet's ocean's surface, encountering some of the greatest impacts of climate change and climate injustice, and striving to be leaders in the defense of this planet. For Pacific Islanders, climate change is personal, urgent, our greatest threat. And yes, we want justice. As stated in the Women Deliver Outcome Statements for the Pacific and the Oceanic Pacific Region, the Pacific is at the front line of the climate crisis, sitting at the nexus of worsening disasters and loss and damage. Fossil fuel driven economies causing rising carbon emissions, accelerating biodiversity loss and threats to our ocean. This is all compounded by the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19, unjust and uneven conditions for many women, lack of long promised climate finance an unfair global macroeconomic systems, and in some places, the long-term impacts of conflict. All work on women's human rights and gender equality must operate across humanitarian, disaster, development, peace, and post-conflict context. Our lived experiences countries and peoples must not be siloed into projects, issues, or parts of a program cycle. For this work, when it comes to addressing climate change and climate justice, we've heard repeatedly how women have a fundamental role. Overlooking gender inequalities seriously weakens the outcomes of climate change and disaster risk approaches and undermines the opportunities to advance climate and gender justice as one. And to add that in our WD 2023 Pacific Outcome Statements, we acknowledge the vulnerable groups experience compounding discrimination and distress associated with climate disasters. And so we need to work collaboratively and inclusively to address the needs of our vulnerable groups at the front line of climate disasters. Our feminist work must consider the interlinkages between climate, economic, and ecological justice, disaster risk reduction, sexual and reproductive health and rights, gender-based violence, unpaid care, and other sets of gender equality work. For example, in Palau, we are working to strengthen women's groups in villages which start up funding to support and enhance resiliency to climate change and disasters such as improved food security. We're working with the community of SR to revitalize traditional terra cultivation to ensure food security. With Gotela de Oreng, we are promoting breastfeeding and family health to support mothers and their babies. And with the Om Rasang, the government has developed a women's leadership program, including a, a focus on women with disabilities. Increasing community outreach programs and strengthening community-based resilience with a gender focus is essential for Palau. Palau has designated 80% 
of its exclusive economic zone as a national marine sanctuary, equivalent to 475 square kilometers, 475,000 square kilometers of its national waters for marine conservation, cultural, and food security. The Palau National Marine Sanctuary is a climate change adaptation measures established by law. The threat of climate change will not disappear. It will not disappear from our islands. So at a local level, we need to become more resilient and more gender equal while also working at a global level to demand climate justice. In closing, I'd like to remind us about the three of the key messages we have heard today, which we can take away and use as we work together to force actions post WD 2023. We have heard how climate justice and gender justice are intertwined. Climate justice is gender justice. Climate change disproportionately threatens the most vulnerable girls and women in all their intersecting identities. Engaging girls, youth, and women in climate action is central to advancing gender equality and strengthening both individual and community resilience to the climate crisis. That brings me to the second key point resonating through today's discussions the importance of collaboration and solidarity across movements. We've heard how diverse social justice issues intersect with climate change and how collaboration across movements and sectors can enhance collective efforts. It's up to us to use this knowledge to force, forge alliances and bridges and bridge the divides in our own climate activism. As we collaborate, we must work to amplify each other's voice and strengthen joint action, especially women-led movements, feminist women, human rights defenders, and all those working at the grassroots level. We must work to transform our societies, our states, and our world for the best outcomes for all people including women and girls. That's the third key takeaway from this morning. We are reminded of the importance of placing communities and their perspectives at the center of climate discussions and decision-making processes. In closing, I again thank the speakers and the organizers of this morning's session. Most importantly, I thank everyone in the room attending this Women Deliver conference and working in their respective spaces to improve gender equality and to mobilize together for change and for advancing climate and gender justice in this dangerous, complex, but still hopeful times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency VP. Thank, you, so Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, that's it. <laughs> I have nothing left to say, I think. <laughs> thank you so much. So I just want to thank you for staying until the end and uh, for sharing all the emotions. Um, I feel slightly shaken, but I'm totally inspired, totally determined. Goodbye, thank you.